Hello, this is Denise from Something Beautiful Handcrafts, and this breed study is Parendale. Now, Parendale is not a particularly old breed. It's, it's relatively new when you think about sheep breeds and development. And let me tell you a little bit about Parendale. Um, it was developed in New Zealand by Sir Jeffrey Perrin. Oh, well, and um, it's a cross between Romney and Cheviot. And when you feel it, I mean, that totally makes quite a bit of sense to me. Um, a long wool and a heel breed. And it's like a longer, smoother version of Cheviot. Very much like it. Not as springy and crimpy, but it's got it's fairly decent crimp. And a lot more woolly, if I can use that phrase, than uh, a long wool. I probably could get more into it specifically, but I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so anyway, the cross was made primarily to improve um, the meat carcass. So this is mostly a meat breed with a, a dual purpose. Average micron count is between 28 and 32. And so if you're familiar with Romney, basically this is coarse. Uh, the should have an average of a five inch staple, which makes pretty good sense because it's longer than the average Cheviot staple. That's of course what makes it a long wool. It felt wonderfully. And we all know that Cheviot does not, but Romney does. So this adds that felting ability into the fiber. Now it should have a full handling. And that's kind of what I mean when I say that it's a bit, it's more wooly. Um, it's a really full feel and look to the fiber. Um, it's weighty. Okay. Um, it still has that springy and crispness to it. But it's not harsh. Like I said, it's a softer version of Cheviot. It's not harsh. Though it is um, coarse. There's a difference. There really is a difference. Okay. It's got a, a low luster. It's not high luster like the long wools are. And it doesn't have that flat kind of quality. That chalky quality that Cheviot would have. Okay. So it's like I said, it's in between the two. Uh, it's well formed. And it's a free and open staple. So you can see the Cheviot is really dense and crimpy. And uh, Romney is looser. So this it has a really nice free form, but it's an open crimp. Look at that. Not really a compact, but it's an open crimp. Okay, now also it's suitable for carpet. And of course, looking at the Romney, it would be in Cheviot suitable for outer garments. So it works about well. And there are some that are on that lower side. Um, that lower micron count that are good for knitting. We're going to find out which one this one is. Now. Here's some advice from the Sheep Breeders Association of New Zealand. About how to um, use this yarn. How to spin it. What to expect from it. And they said that you can't produce a typically smooth and dense uh, worsted type yarn okay as the springiness tends to puff it out and if you've ever spun cheviot you'll notice that too even when you spin cheviot and worsted if it's a really really coarse cheviot you'll wind it with rope but most of the time even prepared worsted and spun worsted you know you don't really get a smooth worsted yarn from Cheviot because it's so crimp, crimpy. You can get a really nice smooth worsted yarn from the, the long wools and Romney, but you don't really get it from Cheviot. And so what Cheviot lends to this blend is that, that springiness from the open crimp and the well-formed crimp that keeps you from really getting a, a real smooth, um, tight worsted yarn. So I'm expecting to see this yarn give, have a little puff to it. Okay. Now, let's see. The, what it Well, I guess I'll go ahead and explain that a little bit. It says something about capturing air in the yarn when you spin it worsted. And 
Now, the Sheep Breeders Association New Zealand gives a little advice on what to expect from the yarn made from this. First of all, they advise that you, you can't really produce a typical smooth and dense um, type of worsted yarn as the springiness tends to puff it out. And I found this is pretty much true with the other springy wools, the the hill and down breeds like that, especially Cheviot. You don't really get a real smooth, hard, twisted, worsted weight yarn from Cheviot because it is so springy. It still tends to puff out even when you're, you know, you're spinning it hard and trying to get real smooth like you can with the long wools or some of the other coarser wools. So you're, you're not going to really expect that. Expect that if you spin this a certain thickness when you um, when you set the yarn, you're going to get it springier than what it appeared when you just take it off of the um, the bobbin. And even as you're watching the twist go in, and then you're you know you double back and look at it, it is going to puff up more than what it looks like i'll show you as i spin it it'll make sense to you okay because what happens is that that puffiness that springiness of the wool it captures the air in the yarn as you spin it worsted okay so you do get the strength of the worsted spin but um you're getting the added warmth from that air being trapped inside of the fiber hmm it's gonna be really nice so I'm gonna spin this worsted basically because don't I spin everything worsted and then you'll, you'll kind of get the idea of seeing how uh, it's going to puff out uh, it's suggested also that because it you really aren't going to get that really smooth springy, well, uh, that really smooth, slick yarn when you spin it worsted, that this is best suited to spinning woolen. And the suggestion is to cut the fibers into two and a half uh, inch lengths, spin it long draw from Rolex. Okay, so hopefully that, that made some kind of sense. I still want to spin it worsted. I spin everything worsted. But it looks like there's probably about, I thought there was only an ounce. Now that I've pulled it out of the bag, looks like there's probably about two ounces. So maybe I'll spin one half woolen, one half worsted, and then you can kind of see the difference. I can just imagine it's going to be a little puffier than the other. Okay, so here is my fiber study chart. And this particular Parendell came from my Knit Fairy stash and it's already been washed uh, so I don't even know what kind of grease weight that the Paradell would carry to me Chevy is not very greasy and the long wools are, are well the exception of thin I haven't handled BFL raw yet I have some I just haven't done it but generally they don't very they don't seem really greasy to me they're they seem to be more waxy than greasy except fin which can be very very greasy but it is one of the finer long wools okay I digress but at any rate it's already been washed and here it is in fleece form and I have a preference of course for fibers in fleece form because when you get them already processed they're already stretched out and you don't really get a, a good idea of how these individual wools are so very different. And you know what? I should go and get a, a bunch of different types of wools and lay them out across so that you can get a really good sense of how much different they are. What the crimp looks like on the fine wools, what it looks like in the medium wools, how it looks in the long wools. They are very different fibers. And even looking at um, Lester Long Wool. And looking at maybe tea's water or looking at fin and you'll see how very different those different types of wools are and I think I don't want to say you're cheating yourself maybe I do want to make that bold statement that you're cheating yourself if you never handle some of these fibers in raw form I'm not really sure that spinners appreciate 
the differences of these wolves when they're not handled in raw form. Okay, yeah, I made that statement. I, uh, that's what I'm saying, and I'm sticking to it. All right, now, so this is already scoured for me. And uh, Nick Ferry did a very good job. And I'm laying it down on this piece of paper so you can see it just a little better. There are so uh, little uh, bits in these samples. They're just ounce samples, two ounce maybe, sometimes a little bit more. But I, I'm so uh, reluctant to put more than this little teeny bit inside the book. I mean, I have to use up every little scrap. But this is what's going to go in the book here. And it'll go in my section for washed. And then I'm going to spin and ply it. Um, and the prep I'm going to use. Huh, well, for the stuff that I'm going to go ahead and spin worsted. I'm just going to flick the tips, which is what I normally do. For the stuff that I'm going to spin woolen, uh, generally, you would card the woolen. But I don't have any carders. I have a flicker. I don't actually have hand cards. And I had a pair for the Merino, but I sent them back to their owner. So I'm going to run this bad boy through the drum carder after I flick it. And I think I'll roll some roll eggs off of the drum carder. And that'll be my prep for the woolen. Time to get started. Fibers all flicked out. And it's nice and fluffy now. Try to give you a good idea of staple length. That's pretty nice. Looks really good. Okay, so got a lot going on in the background in this space. I'm rotating through crafts, as you can imagine. I used to spin for like hours at a time, but it's just not good for, you know, keeping the tendonitis at bay. Better to prevent it than try to fix it. And so I'm rotating through all sorts of crafts here. Maybe, uh, Next segment, I'll have to. Oh, that was not good. Maybe the next segment, I will have to uh, film it in a different space. We'll see. Okay, I just got to fix that because that did not catch on very well. And I am using the. Well, I'm losing my stuff. I'm using the worsted method. I'm doing a short full work draw. Now, normally. I would not be this close to the orifice, but uh, like I said, I'm trying to hide the rest of the room. And so in order to stay in the camera view, I'm closer than an orifice to the orifice than I would actually normally work. Now that is you that looks pretty compact while I'm holding it under tension. Pull out a little bit and see what it looks like. It's a little fuzzy. That looks nice. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and spin that up. Now I'm going to spin up uh, this worsted, most of it worsted. Then I'm going to take a small section of it and spin it woolen. At the current staple length that it's at, I am probably going to uh, draft it from the fold when I do it woolen. And it'll just be a small segment of it. And... Maybe I'll have just enough woolen for me to knit a tiny swatch. We'll see. I didn't weigh this before I started. Um, most of these samples, I think I said at the beginning, are about an ounce. 
not much more. So, huh. well, well, I have to weigh it and I'll see how much it is. Then I'll know if I'm going to do anything with it uh, besides just have it as a sample, uh, depending on the how thin I spin it and the yardage I get from it. Okay, here are the samples spun out. This is the worsted sample, of course. I'm pretty sure you can tell by looking at it. And this is the woolen sample. The woolen sample, of course, is uh, pretty small because I really don't have much intention of using any woolen yarn at this time. So it's just a brief sample to see the difference. You can see that this this looks fairly smooth at the moment. It won't be quite so smooth once I wash it. It's got a little nice halo over here. Oh yeah, now you can see that really good halo. But it's nowhere near as smooth and tight as it would be if it was just raw me by itself. Uh, and uh, pretty much those springy breeds are like that. Cheviot is like that. I mean, you could, you spin it hard, but it still has a spring to it. A little bit of loft, and it even spun worsted. And I mean, it's really like poof here when it's spun woolen. And I put my samples in the book. And uh, I didn't use a sample of the, the um, whole lock length. Because, oh boy, I'm just like really stingy. And since it's such a small sample, I just, I wanted to spend every ounce of it to make it useful, like just every little teeny bit of it. So what I pulled out here is not really representative of the staple length, but it is very representative of the crimp. And that was more important to me than anything else was representing the crimp. Okay, so here we have side by side the worsted spun versus the woolen spun, and you can you can see the glue back there. It's still drying. I just stuck them onto the page. And this is the example of what it looked like when it was flicked. Nice and fat and lofty. And I'll give that glue some time to dry. I, I didn't get a lot of waste. This is all of the waste that I got from that bunch. And uh, maybe there's two or so odd ounces. Probably two ounces roughly. Um, on this skein, I didn't count the worsted skein. I mean, the woolen skein. I didn't count that one. Well, it's probably two or three yards on that one. But I wound up with 153 yards of the worsted skein. Now, normally, the breed studies are not complete until I make a project with it. And I really haven't decided what I want to do with it yet because I don't have anything lined up. Huh. So I will give it some thought, uh, and you'll know because either there'll be another segment at the end of this video, or there'll just be the end of this video. <laughs> Here's how it turned out. This is from the scan of Parendell. Uh, this is lace collar number one from the Victorian um, knitting publication home work by a period m period you know i really don't know what the am stands for but that's what it's written for as the author or author or editor so if you're interested in how this pattern went or what i did with the yarn and specific for this pattern you can watch the historic knitting video on this pattern and i'll put a link in the description um, soon because I actually made both videos at the same time so I have to completely edit that video and this one will probably go on first so you have to check back later and get a link to that video thanks for watching take care of yourself thanks to my subscribers if you're not a subscriber click the subscribe button and make sure you click the like button as well thank you very much have a great day